So short stem cell to be preferred in young patients. That was the title given to me. Um, it does not work here. Ah, it's good. So um, that's my disclosures, and you see I may uh, be a little bit biased uh, talking about short stems. So I nevertheless would like to change the title to Are Short Stems to be Preferred in Young Patients? So a question mark is necessary. But the problem is, what is a short stem? Short is can be very short and can be a little bit longer, and nobody really knows what a short stem uh, is really defined. So a group in the orthopedics in 2015 tried to do some classification on all those stems as you see here. So they came up with uh, uh, neck-preserving stems, um, stems they are really doing a neck-preserving osteotomy, but go down. It's not like the very short one, like the, the spiron. Then you have the, the ones they call trochanter sparing, and then you have the trochanter harming uh, uh, short stems. And it's surprising. You would think this is a trochanter harming looks, in, in, in my uh, opinion, awesome or horrible, whatever you want to call it. But the Results are, are at, at least at, um, con uh, in relation, when you see this study, not so bad. 12.3 years, 99.5 survival rate. It's amazing. So what should be our goal for the young patient? The long-term survival. And who, uh, what is uh, responsible for a long-term survival? It's bone preservation. I think it's the number one. But on the other hand, it's also soft tissue pres preservation. It depends on your approach, what you are doing to preserve in the long term the soft tissue. You have to deal it when you have to do a revision if the soft, uh, soft tissue wasn't maintained properly. And you have the problem, you have to be careful what you are choosing, material, articulation. This is a case from la last week, <coughs> 10 years in this prosthesis. You see it is completely used in the area of the lateral edge, and you would think that must be, uh, uh, that must be a, a poly um, insert. No, that was the case. It was completely black. I punctured the, uh, did an uh, aspiration from the joint. It looked like oil in an old car. And this was when we took it out. So it was completely used, the metal part. It was a combination between, between ceramic and, um, and metal insert. Horrible. So you can't debride this bone. So the, the, metal, the metal parts had taken away at least one-third of the acetabulum. It was just gone. And the, the femur, the proximal femur, looked horrible. And this patient is uh, not 40 years old. So we will have, in the future, cases like that, and it will be very difficult to deal with. Long-term survival means bone preservation. A stem like that, after 11 years, you almost have no bone left. Maybe a very bad stem in the long term. How can you deal with that if you have a periprosthetic fracture? So they did a study. It's not important what stems you see here. It was Fitmore Mayo and CLS. It was, it's just to show you what's going on when you put in a prosthesis into a bone. So that was done in Ulm. This study, they compared three different stems. And the interesting thing is they measured on, at several levels the stress distribution in the bone and compared it to the natural bone. And what you see when you put in a total hip, it's always that you have a reduction in comparison to the natural bone in load introduction into the bone. 
And this is sometimes very high, and it may be lower in other parts. So we can compare here in the CLS stem, you see in the proximal part where you want to maintain your bone, you have a load introduction that is reduced to 90, uh, uh, around 90%. That means very little load goes into the bone in this area. It's a little bit better in the Mayo, and it's better in the Fitmore, but nevertheless, you have still 60% loss of load introduction in the proximal femur. That must have an effect on your bone and on your bone preservation. It's not on the, uh, just on the, on the Fitmore, it's the same on the Optimus. It's a little bit better in the short stems than in the long stems. So what we have to keep in mind, then every implantation of uh, a total hip in changes the load transfer into the bone. And what we have to have as a goal is we have to reduce the stress shielding as much as possible. We have to work on that, especially for the young patients. It seems that it has an effect. This was a DEXA study on, uh, on the short stem, and it shows, comparison to a long stem, the disappearance of bone was less in the short stem in comparison to the, short, uh, to the long stem. If we go to our series register in Switzerland, we see that the short stems, they are all green. They do quite well in comparison to other stems. But we have also stems they do not as good, and they are also short stems. Unfortunately, these are relatively low numbers. It may be also a problem of the surgeon. I don't know, but these are quite important outliners. They shouldn't happen uh, after so, uh, such a short time. Just to show you, this, these are x-rays 10 years down the road in those patients, young patients I choose randomly. I didn't uh, look at just the first, second one. So that, those are out of the first 100 fit more stems. And what you see in the short stem, the bone is, in all cases, nicely preserved. It's almost normal bone. It's not as you see often that the bone disappears in the proximal part. Planning. If you, do, uh, if you can do a long stem, in general, you can also do a short stem. But you have to be careful. Even in the one here, in the classification, it was not a neck-preserving stem. It has a longer neck preservation in comparison to, for example, this avenue, uh, the Avenir. And it can make problems. This is the longest, as you can see, and it, it can make problems. This is one of my patients, young, relatively young patient. I put in a, a fit more stem, and I had the problem to bring it really into a normal position. It has a little bit varus. But you, what you see on the same time, I had a problem that I couldn't bring it around in the correct position, and you can see it preoperatively, that this angle is very angled. So that means that this patient was producing stress. It was not producing stress at the tip. Surprisingly, it was producing stress in the anterior surface of the stem, uh, as you can see here and the, in the sagittal, in the, in the coronal plane. And I had to exchange it to a longer stem. So you have to be careful, and you have to do your planning in all those patients. Nevertheless, we like the short stems, especially in uh, dysplastic cases, as you very often have young patients. This is one 10 years down the road. And so we have a technique, and I was yesterday asked several times how you do the uh, trochanteric osteotomy. I would like to repeat it because we often do in these plastic cases where we have to build up the acetabulum, we do it over a stepped trochanteric osteotomy, which was a question in the, uh, in the, uh, in the course yesterday. So we have the trochanter, and we do a first, <coughs> we 
aim to have a flat one, but then we do the first cut ending three millimeters higher up after about two thirds in length of the, of the trochanter, as you can see here. We leave a saw blade in place, and then you can do your second osteotomy like that, and you have a gap in between of six millimeter. You can go completely parallel to your saw blade, and then you use a six millimeter chisel, and then you lift your trochanteric fragment, and you will have an easy uh, uh, way to reduce your trochanter in a uh, good position. So this is how we do a uh, uh, rebuild up of the acetabulum. This is not very important, but it's important to see that it works. And what is very nice that you can see, if you use an allograft in the acetabulum, 10 years down the road, it is completely disappeared and it works. And you see the proximal femur looks the same. Uh, it has very good bone quality and it's no, no uh, bone shielding. Uh, stress shielding. The same here, once again in a dysplastic hip, how we do the technique, bringing down the center uh, in the right place, and this, uh, this is also 10 years down the road, your proximal femur looks normal, the bone is completely maintained, and you would think about in another 10 years it could be absolutely the same. But sometimes you have to realize you can't use a short stem. Uh, as in this case, you see here the calcar is very steep compared to the other side, and in those cases you have to be prepared to use an, an other implant. For example, we use quite often in those cases a uh, Wagner conus stem. This is also ten, uh, this is two years down the road. So you have to be prepared to have other implants using in difficult cases, and so it's depending on the planning, very much this one. In this one, you can't use a short stem. Even the patient is relatively young. In those patients, you have to use another implant. So, accept that you heavily depend on planning. Do your planning, and, that you, and you have to know that in uh, total hips with DDH, sometimes you have to follow unusual rules. Short stems are to be preferred in young patients, yes, where they fit. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>